Good afternoon to all um, to all the organizations present today. I would like to open hearing number eight of the 183rd period of sessions of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, which is entitled Situation of Human Rights of Groups in Situation of Vulnerability in Cuba. And the hearing was requested by the organizations Red de Cultura Inclusiva, Red de Aulas Abiertas, I Red de Asuntos de la Mujer. My name is Estuardo Ralón. I'm the first vice president of the Inter-American Commission and rapporteur for Cuba. Today with me are Commissioner Margaret May Macaulay, second vice president of the commission, and Commissioner Esmeralda Rosemena de Troitinio, and Commissioner Carlos Bernal. Today with me are also the Assistant Executive Secretary for Monitoring, Maria Claudia Pulido, the Special Rapporteur for Economic, Social, Cultural, and Environmental Rights, Soledad Garcia Munoz, and the Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression, Pedro Baca. I would like to greet the representatives of the civil society. I also would like to explain how time will be distributed. Civil society will have 30 minutes and you can share your remarks with us. And after that, the commission, we have 30 minutes to react to those comments and remarks. And then civil society organizations will have another 30 minutes to make their final remarks. Um, there are some additional indications we have a timer to measure the time. You can see the timer on the screen. And we also have simultaneous interpretation and closed captioning. These public hearings are streamed on YouTube and on social media. And the recordings of the hearings are available on the YouTube channel of the Inter-American Commission. Um, now, I would like to open the hearing and give the floor to civil society for 30 minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners, rapporteurs of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. We would like to thank you for this opportunity to present this report before in this hearing. We regret that our colleagues from Cuba are not able to participate because they are the ones who are living and suffering the violation of their rights. Today with me, we have Caterina Mojena. She's a member of the Patriotic Union of Cuba, and she's the advocate of Cuba Decide, Cuba Decides. My name is Anurka Gonzalez. I'm also a member of the Red Inclusiva Cuba. We would like to discuss today the situation of groups of vulnerability in the context of the protests of July 11th, 2021 in Cuba. As you know, these were the largest protests in the last 20 years. Not, um, not only the population or the number of people who participated is important because, because the protests occurred all over Cuba. The protests were massive and peaceful, and they were because of the damage caused by COVID-19 and the impact on population, and because also people is tired of the actions of the government. And there were other organizations, uh, such as Justicia 11J, who reported that there are over 1,900 people who were detained due to the peaceful protests. 440 were tried because of the protests. And so far, and 207 people have been convicted because of their participation in the protests. We would like to highlight what the IACHR said regarding the situation of human rights in Cuba in 2020, that human rights defenders in the island were at a specific situation of risk because they are victims of 
constant violations of their human rights. And this includes arbitrary detentions, criminalization processes, and judicial persecution, especially because of the effectiveness of ambiguous legal types in the criminal code. Within the framework of the July protests, uh, rights recognize not only the political constitution of the country, which was approved in 2019, but also the rights enshrined in international instrumentals instruments such as the American Convention were violated. These rights included equality before the law, protection against arbitrary detentions, right to integrity, right to the uh, freedom of association, right to regular proceedings, right to freedom of assembly, and also right to free movement. In this report, we would like to talk about the violation of human rights committed against human rights defenders, including women, young people, adolescents, and persons with disabilities. We know that the government was especially harsh against those who protested during the protest in July last year. Many adolescents were not released even months after the protests, as you will see later. The organization Unas Abiertas that is presenting this report together with other civil society organizations is a network that since 2010 tries to strengthen the principles of democratic leadership among activists in Cuba. The network has called up on different activists from civil society groups that are working to promote a transforming education to guarantee the rights of the Cuban people. The report includes the opinions of people from different collectives and groups, including the Red de Cultura Inclusiva, the Red, the Red de Asuntos de la Mujer, the Social Platform Centros de Esperanza, and the initiative Cuba Decide or Cuba Decides. These organizations have appeared before the commission in different hearings to discuss violations of human rights against human rights defenders, women activists, and persons with disabilities. We have prepared this report for 2021 because we realized that there were several violations of human rights during the protest in 2021, especially against persons with disabilities, young people, and women. This report provides more elements regarding the types of violations committed within the framework of the protests. Taking into consideration that over time, we have identified some specific actions committed against human rights defenders, especially women. Our network will be sharing with you a map regarding the types of harassment suffered by women human rights defenders, including also activists and independent journalists. This report is not only a legal report regarding the violation of rights, but it is also a document that makes these groups of people visible. Also, we see here information that has been collected by independent journalist groups and other human rights organizations. Now I would like to give the floor to my colleague, Caterina Mojerna. Violation of human rights. Sorry, I'm having some issues. There is an official version of the Cuban government about what defending human rights means. And as a result, many human rights defenders are victims of social aggression in spite of the existing regulations to protect the integrity of citizens. In most of the cases, this violence exerted by state agents, including, for example, justice operators and law enforcement officers, um, are actions that go against the Constitution of Cuba of 2019 in its Article 52, 54, and 56. Uh, freedom of expression, of movement, and of faith in and of ideology is guaranteed. Are guaranteed. In our report from 2021, we recorded um, a huge number 
of cases of arbitrary detention, a figure that is uh, higher than the one reported in 2020. Out of all those figures, we have uh, women and men. And what we can see is that there are over 1,300 um, people were detained only during the protests of July. We have identified several situations of repression against human rights defenders and against women. But the most important moment of repression was during the peaceful protests of July 2021. And due to the how massive these protests were, the Cuban government committed several human rights violations, in, even after the protests. For example, the agencies of the state uh, damaged and injured several activists, include sisters Anaí and Miranda Leiva that are also part of an organization. Gender violence during the July protests. The use of public force during the protests could constitute a guarantee to protect for those who want to exercise this right. However, as the commission has mentioned, sometimes it's a tool used to violate human rights. And this is especially serious in authoritarian regimes. Um, taking into consideration the treatment against women human rights defenders, some of them were detained because of their participation in the July protests. And we can say that the treatment was inhumane. All the cases that we are presenting are violations committed by security agents against women who decided to go to the streets to protest, to show their lack of content with the government. The types of violations include physical injuries, psychological damage, sexual violence. They were forced to get naked um, and they had to do actions uh, to entertain the officers. And sometimes they were prohibited or they could not receive visits from family members while they were detained. Regarding sexual violence, there are two specific cases that illustrate this situation within the framework of the protests. First, a 17-year-old student, Gabriela Sequeira, she was detained in the municipality of San Miguel de Padron in La Habana just because she was closing, was walking close to the protests. She was detained and she was forced to get naked and she was threatened with being taken to a male prison center where she could have suffered a sexual violation. She was convicted to 11 months of prison. Since she is a minor, she has house arrest. And she could not appeal the decision. There is another case of sexual violence that is Elena case. She is 52 years old. She was detained in Guantanamo by two agents while she was participating in a peaceful protest. When she was detained, she had to get naked. She had to do exercise, exercise while she was naked. And after several um, hours of detention, she was released psychological harassment and against women human rights defenders is constant. It includes uh, several actions to promote hatred against women defenders. And also this affects their emotional stability. And they are attacked just because they defend their rights. They use or this goes beyond arbitrary detentions or violence. We know that there are several examples of other cases. Araceli Gonzalez said that she was surveilled in Villa Clara. Also, Carolina Barrero and other women journalists and advocates, including bloggers and influencers. And I myself, while I was living in Cuba, we suffered these attacks. The repression of the Cuban government affects 
independent journalists. They do not have a place where they can live. And they have received several um, attacks. As you will be able to see in the next part, we will present a draft describing the violence against human rights defenders. We would like to talk about the common characteristics of these attacks, for example, the type of perpetrators, etc. We would like to show you some cases so that you can see how violent attacks are committed against women defenders. And even though it is true that during the protests of July, there were several hundreds of violations against uh, people, we would like to say that violations against women defenders are systematic. We have, for example, the case of San Lee. Uh, she is a member of a political party and she is also an advocate of Cuba Decide. She was sentenced together with her father to eight and nine years of prison. They were detained in July 21 a week later after the protests, and they did not participate in the protests. They were detained in a police station in their municipality, and they went to the police station because they were concerned for the political uh, party members who had been detained. They were arrested violently. Sally was uh, taken by several women. They took her by the neck and her father was taken away. Currently, they are appealing hopelessly. In Cuba, there is no rule of law. And in Cuba, all the institutions answer to the Communist Party, to power. And then we have another case that is Amara Nieto Muñoz. She's also an advocate of Cuba Decide. She was detained when she was leaving the headquarters of Damas de Blanco because she wanted to protest to, to claim for the freedom of political prisoners. She was convicted to four years of prison for the crimes of contempt and damage. Another colleague was convicted to two years of prison. And both women have small children. And anyway, the state decided to convict them um, anyway. Uh, they violate their rights to receive phone calls. Uh, they cannot denounce the critical situation of the prison center and they cannot talk to their children. And sometimes they are isolated in punishment cells. And lastly, in February, recently, she was convicted again to five years of prison. In spite of the fact that the trial proved her innocence because those who were detained in the facts said that Nieto Munoz had nothing to do with these facts. We have another case of Ms. Amora, 24 years old. She's also a political uh, member of a political party. She's also an advocate for Cuba Decide. And she is in prison and she has been convicted to six years of prison for the crimes of attack. And these were fake crimes made up by the state after the protest of July. Last September, there was, she was accused by the prosecutor office of the regime. And she, they said that she was against the regime during the protest and that why, that's why she was detained and convicted. And her family presented an appeal. Of course, it was dismissed and she went to prison in December last year. Finally, we would like to talk about Rosa. In July 11th, this young woman from San Antonio de los Baños, 25 years old, was detained by agents 
in the city where the protest began. She was convicted to six years of prison for contagion of the pandemic. Her family had to go through several police stations to find her daughter because public officials didn't want to provide them with information about her whereabouts. Her mother searched for her and finally found her in the San Antonio prison. She could only visit her daughter for 10 minutes with, uh, with the presence of a police officer. And she, um, the girl could not receive food. Um, her mother realized that she had sexual diseases because of her detention, that she was uh, hit and she had not received medical attention. She was denied access to a lawyer uh, by the state. So the family decided, decided to hire a private lawyer. And they told her that this was a punishment for participating in the protests. And the lawyer said that she has had no access to the files of the case against this girl. Also, we have prepared a form in order to identify the different forms of political violence against women defenders, but I would like to mention some points. This form is being completed anonymously. 31 women have already filled this form in nine provinces of the country. Uh, most of the women uh, who filled the form are human rights defenders, 23 of them. And among the types of violence, we have um, jokes, we have violence, kicks, physical violence, and there are only uh, we have also the example of murder, even though we, there are no reports about this. And they identified that the perpetrator were state agents. Now I would like to give the floor to my colleagues, um, to Diego Ato. He will be talking on behalf of my colleagues in Cuba because of the internet connection, our activists there cannot be here. So I would like to give the floor to my colleague. Thank you, Catherine. Now we will talk about the situation of uh, persons with disabilities. We will talk about the situation of the rights of persons with disabilities within the framework of the protests of July the 11th. Um, in relation to several articles of the American Declaration. Article two says that all persons are equal to the, uh, before the eyes of the law. Article 17 says that all persons have the right to be recognized as subject of, subjects of rights and obligations. Article 25 says that no one can be deprived of their liberty only in the cases established by pre-existing laws. Article 26 says that all accused are innocent until proven otherwise. Now, the political harassment human rights defendants with disabilities are subjected to uh, will be discussed now. This, is, this occurs not only with persons with disabilities, also with their family members who, um, the, because they fear the violence that might be exerted by the government against them if they report this publicly. Also, they fear their, their condition as persons of disability, with disabilities won't be recognized during their uh, detention. Now, the case of Junior Sotolonga, a young man with a hearing disability, he was 20, he's 24, and in, his mother reported his uh, detention. She called Radio Marti and said that her son had been arrested since July the 11th, accused of participating of the popular report, um, March in Havana. She says that her son did not participate in the in those protests. She said that when people 
learned about this, people went to the streets to see what was going on. And that's why he was detained. He was first detained at a, a prison for the youth where her mother was only able to see him once. He was then transferred to a prison in Havana. That's also the case of a young man of 37 years old with a motor disability who uh, sells food. He was detained during the protests of July 11th. He said that he went to manifest uh, peacefully. And days later, he started receiving phone threats, but he kept with his uh, usual activities. One morning, he was uh, he received a subpoena from the police saying that he had to go to a police cent central. And they started uh, bugging him because of his physical problems. They said that with his physical disabilities in another system, he would have been no one. Then they left him in his underwear. Everyone could see him in a prison cell. And that is seen on a video shared by, a, by DNA Cuba. The authorities uh, seem to speak to persons with disabilities in a very biased and prejudiced discourse. They say that they cannot do anything without the help of the state. They say that they should thank the state and the revolution for what, what little things they have. Gongora also said that he spent a year at a prison where uh, he had to sleep on the floor. He, there was no ventilation. And when he was transferred, he had to live uh, next to a prisoner who had uh, COVID symptoms. They wanted to murder us, he said. I got COVID and another 20 uh, prisoners as well. That's also the case of Reine Pacheco, who was detained in July. He has three kinds of epilepsy. And according to his sister, that day he was walking, he was coming with my mom from the hospital and uh, police officers stopped him and took him. The family spent several weeks unaware of his whereabouts until a prisoner reached the family and said that uh, Ranier was at the Mayabek prison. He was released in August, but his sister said that other persons who were detained with him told him that uh, Rene received, um, was attacked, physically attacked. There's another case of a minor. He was, he's 14 year old. He has a mental disability, Christopher. And his mother said that on July 17, the police arrested him and accused him for vandalism, for participating in the peaceful protests. His mother said that his son had been beaten by officers of the uh, Ministry for the Interior. He was processed in Havana. He spent 12 hours there under investigation. My son was mistreated, she said. I talked to him and he told him that they are slapping him, my underage son with special problems, she said. This case was shared by the New York Post as well. Christopher was released on August 25th, 2021. Also the case of Javier Delgado, 53, uh, part of the opposition who was detained on July 11th at 11 p.m. for his participation in the protests, uh, asking for, he asked for um, freedom and he was convicted for the uh, crime of public disorder. He has a heart condition, he um, is obese and he has one arm missing, one missing arm. He has not been cared. He has not received the care of physicians. He needs the help of his co-prisoners to uh, go on with his daily activities. Other, there are in the, re the report mentions other persons with disabilities, even underage prisoners, and their condition is never taken into account. And some of them are mistreated. Now I will give the floor to Juan Miguel, who is in Cuba, and left his presentation. Good afternoon, I'm Juan Miguel 
the uh, deputy coordinator of Centro Esperanza, a platform that defends the rights of the LGBTI people and persons who live with AIDS in our island, I would like to thank the commission for allowing me to present this report and to mention the criminalization of minors during the protests of July the 11th. The food scarcity, the medicine scarcity, the lack of opportunity for youngsters uh, made thousands of young uh, men and women to uh, call for changes in Cuba their freedom of expression is systematically vulnerated. After their participation in the protests of July the 11th, many youngsters have been facing convictions of 15, 20 or 25 years of prison. These youngsters are still incarcerated since July, 2021 as their families have shared. They are not the only ones. 43 Cuban citizens under 21 years old are incarcerated in Cuba for protesting peacefully. There's, um, uh, they are still waiting for the ratification of their conviction. Out of the um, information we have, we know that they are between 14 and 21, 10 of them are under 16 and 29 of them are under 17 years old. 36 of them are children, are boys, seven are girls. They were uh, processed and 14 of them have been deprived of their liberty. It's amazing that 11 of the 14 minors who were still in jail were accused of um, sedition and a crime that appears in our criminal court. The convictions for that crime are between 10 and 20 years. And this, uh, our, the law says that if the crime is committed during the alteration of public order on a, or in a military zone, and uh, if the accused uh, use, the, use violence, which they didn't. Of course, the, the, the detainees suffer, are subjected to violence in prison. One of them suffered two stabs. This young man who had no uh, criminal history could be deprived of his liberty for 15 years for the alleged crime of sedition. It wasn't the first time he suffered uh, physical violence at, in prison. This part of the report is being recorded and not live streamed because of the restrictions we face in Cuba. So it's very difficult for us to have um, virtual meetings and uh, with the uh, commission. We would like to thank you. And now I will give the floor to the rest of my colleagues. Okay, thank you. Time's up, the first 30 minutes have gone by. I would like to thank, uh, thank you for all the information we have received. We now will move on to the comments of the Inter-American Court, um, Inter-American Commission, sorry. I am the Rapporteur for Cuba. I will start with the comments then. First, I would like to recognize the bravery of human rights advocates facing a tragic situation because the cases are just terrible. the cases you have described today. And there are differentiated effects here because Catherine Mohena was telling us about the differentiated effects on women, the effects of these violations of systematic repression and violence 
and they were even convicted to prison in, hu in inhuman proceedings. And we're talking about people who are trying to visibilize these situations. There's no respect for their warranties. At the commission, we have also seen the connectivity issues. We have had experience with this. There are problems in, with the Cuban connection, not only when we have a hearing from Cuba coming, um, sometimes the connection gets blocked when some groups try to express against the regime. Their access to the internet seems to be blocked and that's an obstacle for them to uh, exert their legitimate right to protest. Also, Danielka Gonzalez told us about persons with disabilities as a reporter. Well, she has told us that there's cruel treatment and degrading treatment toward persons with disabilities. And this is something I condemn. And I would like to say that the commission um, is always paying attention to Cuba. The plenary of the commission issued its report on the situation of human rights in the island and the plenary and both special rapporteurships have expressed in their press releases the situation of human rights violations in Cuba. The information you are presenting allows us to do a better work because they supplement our monitoring work. You have brought some figures and particular data about how um, these vulnerable groups are affected. I would like to once again repeat the commitment of the commission to uh, keep on joining you in this legitimate fight for the defense of human rights, even though we know the regime in the island won't allow the um, commission, the commission's visit, but we, we will continue to monitor the situation. We continue to grant precautionary measures. We visibilize the situation through our press releases, and we will continue to do this because it's the only mechanism that allows us to support the fight against the regime in the island. We would like to thank you for all this information. You have all of our commitment. Now, I would like to um, hand over the floor to my colleagues and the rapporteurs. So I would like to ask Commissioner McCauley, the second vice president of the commission, if she would like to use the floor. Oh, God. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, Mr. President, thank you very much. Um, I just have um, some very short um, matters to deal with. Um, first of all, I thank um, um, the representatives who, of civil society who have brought this issue to our attention. And I thank you and applaud you for the work you're doing. And I also applaud the uh, peaceful protesters in Cuba every time they go out on a protest. I think you all are extremely brave and determined. And um, one hopes that at some stage one will succeed. Um, we, are, we are sort of quite well acquainted with what is happening in Cuba in, Cuba in relation to the disinterest of the powers that be in upholding and promoting the rights of human rights of, of citizens in the country. Um, and especially um, within the standards of the inter-American system and the in international global system, um, as we recognize. 
I wanted to ask you, is there any, any knowledge, any whisper um, um, about the possibility that there will be legislation um, to deal with um, uh, protection of the law and by law um, of, uh, to, of the right to not to suffer violence or discrimination um, uh, of any woman, whatever the age cycle with, within womanhood in Cuba. Um, I say this because this one, one has been talking about this for many years and there's been not even a whisper that uh, as far as I know that this would happen. So have you heard anything of there being the faintest possibility uh, um, of this? And I also, even though we haven't discussed this group of persons, I also wanted to ask you a question in relation to um, elderly persons, um, people who are within the senior citizen elderly um, group, um, who have worked hard during their lives and are now supposed to be enjoying periods of retirement at, at, with a dignified level of life. Could you tell us something about how they are treated? And could you also specify how they were treated during the peaceful, during the peaceful protests or any kind of protest or just standing looking at people protesting, um, whether there were any incidents and how are they ever treated with respect due for their age? And also, um, if you can help, could you give us figures as to how many uh, persons within the elderly uh, group, especially those who are disabled, um, those who are mentally or physically uh, um, unhealthy, uh, and how they're treated within the um, um, institutions of de um, detention. Um, I think with that, I will stop so that um, others can have um, um, the opportunity to, to, to speak. And, and please, if you, if you cannot give me any answers now, please send it to us in writing. I will be most grateful. Thank you. Muy bien, muchas gracias, Comisionada. Margaret. Thank you very much, Commissioner. I will now give the floor to Commissioner Arosemena. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you. I think that the um, presentation, we know that 30 minutes is not enough for the presentation of your report, but in your explanation, there's a lot of detail about the elements you have been able to identify and assess. When you were explaining the consideration of the Cuban constitution in terms of human rights, you were you asked a question how do the authorities and the government see the work of advocacy for human rights have you identified if the institutions and authorities in the country do you think that the fact that you defend human rights, that you fight for them. Um, it would seem, it would seem the state is unaware that you have that possibility and that right because it's criminalized. Now, if the new constitution recognizes them, these, you were talking about the articles where these rights are enshrined. 
what's the explanation the authorities give for disregarding these rights, for ignoring them? How do they respond to whatever you say? Uh, isn't there a public arena for you to ask these questions? Just so we can understand the position of the authorities in the application of these rules, I'd like to know if on the report you um, have a way to explain the interpretation of the institutions about this. And also, what you said, um, the categories you mentioned of human groups, you were talking about um, adolescents and youngsters. I would like, I don't know if that appears on the report. I suppose it, it doesn't appear and we will see that in further detail, but that identification of how the amount of, of the amount of adolescents, but also I would like to know if on this report, you have the um, information about the current situation of these persons. Are they still detained? Are they free? And if they are free, what uh, condition are they in because of their participation in these protests uh, for their rights? Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Commissioner. Now I will give the floor to Commissioner Bernal. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Commissioners who speak before me, who spoke before me. I would like to echo what my colleagues, the Commissioner, said. I would like to thank civil society organizations for joining us today and for presenting us with all this information. I would like to ask the Anurka if it's possible to give us more information regarding the violation of the rights of persons with disabilities beyond um, the places that you mentioned because you told, talked about the protests and so on, but taking into consideration your presentation, it seems that persons with disabilities, um, I am in charge of said rapporteurship and they are not enjoying uh, of any accommodations in other areas of their life in Cuba. So I would like to know if you could give us more information in that regard, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I th think that the Assistant Executive Secretary has a question, so I would like to give her the floor. Thank you, Chair Rallon. Um, just to um, uh, continue with the line of questioning of Commissioner Arosemena, we would like to have a specific information regarding the figures uh, that they have or disaggregated data that they have regarding their gender, age, and the conditions of those persons that are being deprived of their liberty. And I would like to say that in line with the question asked by Carlos Bernal, I would like to know the challenges that you have faced regarding the legal capacity of persons with disabilities. So those are my two questions. Commissioner Rallon, I would like to greet all those who are here today in this virtual room. Thank you, Secretary. Now I would like to give the floor to our special reporter, Soledad Garcia Munoz. Thank you, Commissioner and Chair of this hearing. It's a pleasure to greet all of you today, especially to the commissioners and executive secretary as uh, the commissioner and country rapporteur has said, 
Cuba is being monitored by the Commission through its different mandates, and this includes the Redesca. And I would like to say that at the beginning of the hearing, you were saying that the origin of the protests or the reasons of the protests are because of the consequences of the pandemic on Cuban people. That has to do with the scarcity of meds, the scarcity of food, the lack of job opportunities. And we would like to, we are here also to let you know about the work that the commission and the country rapporteurship has been doing in order to prepare a report on union and labor rights in Cuba. We believe that you can help us by filling a form that is available and is at the disposal uh, for civil society organizations. The deadline is March 26th, so it would be great to have all the information that you consider relevant for this report. It's going to be the first in the matter in the case of Cuba. And in this time, I would like to know how these three organizations face challenges regarding their labor rights. I'm talking about women, persons with disabilities, and all those aspects you know about, for example, child labor or any other aspects related to labor or work. We would like to thank you for being here. I would like to thank the commission for allowing me to be in this opportunity. And I would like to thank you for the work that you are doing in Cuba through your organizations. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Rapporteur. Now I would like to give the floor to our Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression, Pedro Vaca. You have the floor, Pedro. Thank you, Chair. I would like to greet commissioners and the Assistant Executive Secretary, and I would like to special greet the organizations who requested this hearing. And if you allow me, Chair, I think that it's also important to highlight uh, the work of documentation of the situation of human rights conducted by civil society. We know that they face so many difficulties. So I think that this is a good opportunity to show our gratitude towards these organizations for their efforts. We know we are well aware of the efforts. We know that there were many people who were going to be here, but they couldn't be here. But I think that we need to acknowledge the work and the efforts you conduct in spite of all the challenges and obstacles. I would like to say that for many years, but especially since July the 11th, we are monitoring the situation of protests in Cuba. And I'm really happy that you are sharing with us other dimensions of the protest, but that you are also sharing with us the differentiated consequences of the protests on specific groups. This diagnosis on the situation of Cuba has been included in several press releases of the commission of the special rapporteurships and also in other periods of sessions. And we are trying to include this situation in our annual reports. We are highly concerned, but your testimonies also confirm some of our fears. When you mentioned cases of judicial proceedings or detentions of adolescents. This is not only a characteristics of the protests. We informed that a significant portion of young people participated in the protests, but we are now being informed that a part of the proceedings are against adolescents. So, um, Commissioner Rapporteur Arosemena, she is well aware of this. We presented a report to call upon states of the continent to protect their right to freedom of expression of girls, boys, and adolescents. 
because that's a way to preserve future guarantees. And some of the situations that you're presenting today are a huge concern. And therefore, in spite of the cases that we are presented today, it would be good to that you could send detailed information to us because we need to have that granular information. Also, I would like to talk about the differentiated impacts on women and journalists or women journalists. I am really concerned, concerned and it's terrible to hear how during the detentions there are cases of degrading treatment. I would like to ask the organizations whether these facts were reported publicly and institutionally. And we would like to know if there is any reaction on the part of the institutions. One of our concerns has to do with the lack or the absence of the state in this dialogue. And I would like to know whether these facts have been reported and if you have any records regarding any institutional reaction that may have occurred. I'm sorry for extending and talking too much, but I also would like to mention something else. Um, there is also uh, some information regarding the use of internet. There are some adjustments in the use of internet that probably affects vulnerable groups. I we would like to know if there is an impact after the changes in the regulations for the use of internet and if there are any breaches in the guarantees regarding the use of internet within this context. And at the beginning of the hearing, um, you were talking about some institutional messages that could lead to stigmatization or hate speech. And that's something that you have mentioned in these hearings. It would be good to have more information about these messages. The Inter-American Commission has called up on the states to have a favorable discourse, in this, especially in terms of controversies or disputes, and also to promote open dialogue, and also to encourage, because otherwise, violence can be promoted against those who think differently. So the commission would be really thankful if you could provide us with more information in this regard. Thank you, Chair. And I'm really happy to be participating in this hearing. Thank you, Rapporteur. With this, we are Mr. going President, to- Mr. Close. President, Mr. President, I don't think you saw my message. I asked for to make one request. I want, I want to take seconds. Hey, I've, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention this, and this is terrible. Yeah, it's see. my sinus tablets that get yes, made like this. Yes, of course. But could you please, um, please give us some information to us as to how Afro-Cubans were treated by the police during the protests? And if you have numbers of how many were taken in and detained, and also particulars of how they treat Afro-Cubans both men and women, boys, girls, and adolescents, and the elderly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Don't worry, Commissioner. Sorry, Commissioner, sorry for not seeing your message before. Your question has been made. And now we would like to give social society organizations 25 minutes to make comments, to make your final remarks, and to answer to the questions of the commission. And after that, we will have the closing of this hearing. We are going here to listen to you for another 25 minutes. Thank you, commissioners, reporters, for your intervention. And due to connection issues, my colleague Catherine now has left the room, and therefore I will try to answer your questions. and. Those uh, that information uh, that we don't have now, we will send that information to you. We have that responsibility, that duty. So I will try to answer uh, as many questions as possible. With regard to the legislation that exists to prevent discrimination against women, the narrated facts show how the situation of gender violence 
because of political reasons in Cuba is not visible uh, yet. And so far, there is no legislation uh, against um, harassment and gender violence against women. There is no legislation. In the island, there is also a denial of the inequalities and the violence suffered by women. There is only a single official organization uh, allowed by the government, but it has been questioned because it only uh, follows the interests of the government. So in Cuba, the issue of gender violence needs to be recognized and needs to be made visible. Human rights defenders, especially women, have demanded the state of Cuba a law against gender violence in order to adopt measures to guarantee the integrity and the respect towards women, especially uh, with regard to, especially from the state and from um, individuals. Regarding how older persons have been treated during the demonstrations, we have information but it's important to highlight that many people report uh, behind doors or in closed doors what's happening, but they are afraid of the repression of the Cuban state. We know about these cases because on social media during the protest of July, we identified there was no distinction in the treatment of minors adults and older persons or persons with disabilities. We are seeing that these people, even for example, persons with disabilities are detained. And we have no information regarding his case, for example. So there is no distinction uh, between adult people. And the government understands that all these people are threats for their administration. We have the case of Celia, for example, who was going to be here today. She is an older woman, woman, but the treatment towards older persons and human rights defenders or persons with disabilities have had the same treatment as everybody. Uh, regarding the question of Carlos Bernal, we would like to say that the state of Cuba has no legislation to protect the rights of persons with disabilities. And there is no law to prevent discrimination against this group of people. There is no legislation or regulation to prevent discriminatory actions that would lead to sanctions or punishments to those institutions that discriminate. The discrimination of the state against persons with disabilities has been reported by one of our networks since 2016. And we would like to make the situation of vulnerability of persons with disabilities in the island. We have law 59 of the civil code that has to do with legal capacity. And in article 30, it restricts any uh, capacity to conduct legal actions or to start legal actions. So people with persons with disabilities are not allowed to start legal actions because of their skills or because of their abilities. You were requesting figures. We don't have a specific figures right now. You need to understand um, this information uh, was prepared and was compiled by different organizations. We have different information and we have all the information that we have in the report, but we will continue to work to try to identify the treatment and the situation of persons detained as a result of the protests of July 11th. We know that there are some people who were released because of precautionary measure and that these people are under house arrest and that they are under constant follow-up. They are threatened, they cannot receive help from abroad and they are subjected to threats and 
um, they have reported this publicly. And I would like to talk about the case of Jose Ferrer Castillo. He's 19 years old and he is accused of making up uh, crimes. And his father, Ferrer Garcia, is isolated in prison Malverde just because of protesting in July 2021. They were detained without any order and therefore their family considered this was a kidnapping. They were disappeared for a time because uh, the authorities decided not to reveal where they were detained. Um, the father is still in prison and in December, the son was not allowed to visit his father because he protested to demand the freedom of his father and other political prisoners. Then he was hit and attacked by state agents. He was forced to get into a car and um, she decided, he decided not to get into the car because there was no legal document and therefore the state agents uh, hit him. They hit him on the face and on the nose and they, they took them, him by force to a police station for seven hours. This happened to two protesters of July 11th. I don't know if there are any other questions that you would like me to reply. I couldn't keep all the questions in my head, sorry. No, I think you've answered to um, all of the things we asked, but we have a couple of more minutes. So I would like you to express um, other perspectives you feel are important for the commission to hear. Well. We have recommendations for the Cuban state that the detainees are released immediately through a law and another regulationary mechanism. Special attention should be paid to those underage and measures, reparation measures should be established by the state. The um, criminal code should be reformed so that there will be no ambiguous uh, figures that will allow uh, human rights defenders to be criminalized. We call for uh, full respect in terms of equality before the law, warranties, due process, freedom of association, of integrity, of circulation and transit, freedom of expression and opinion. The um, for forces of order should be trained to respect the integrity of their detainees and investigations should be carried out to sanction human rights violations by the state authorities. We would like to thank you for allowing us to present on these violations. We know that you are very much aware of what's going on in Cuba. We would like to thank you for always paying attention to the situation in the island. Thank you very much, Daniurka, because at the face of all the adversities, because we lost the connection, you had prepared the video, Catherine already also had connectivity problems, but you were able to present very valuable information and you were also able to answer the commissioner's questions. So we would have to close the hearing, but we have a couple more minutes. So I would like to ask my colleagues or the rapporteurs if you would like to say any final remarks before closing the hearing, just in case someone wants to use the floor. Um, looking at all of you, would you like to say something? Yes, Secretary Pulido. Oh, sorry, Commissioner Margaret. Please let Maria Claudia speak before me. She had her hand up first. <laughs> Muy bien. Thank, you. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, Maria Claudia then. Thank you, 
President Rallon, I would just like to uh, invite the civil society organizations here at this virtual hearing, but I think that other organizations are following this uh, streaming or they can watch it after the hearing afterwards. And we would like to invite the network of organizations being led at the commission as a space for the exchange of um, information, which has been very helpful to receive first-hand uh, information about what's going on in Cuba. Even though within the framework of the report on um, union uh, rights, but would also like to have information about the um, situation of human rights, uh, the human rights in general. Um, Mr. Rallon is the president and uh, we would like to expand the scope of this group, of this network. That would be all for me, Mr. Rallon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary. Commissioner Margaret. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. President, Chair, for uh, this meeting. And I thank you for um, running it so well. Um, yes, um, Danuta, I just wanted to ask you, please, to continue to share information with us. Don't wait for another meeting. Keep on sharing with us and ask your other associates to do so, um, because that's one of the ways that we can best assist. And also, if you want us to communicate with the state, um, tell us and tell us what questions you might want us to ask of the state. And finally, I just wanted to say this. Is it the Federation of Women that you were referring to in Cuba? Um, because I remember many, many years ago, um, the women's movement in the Caribbean used to have meetings with the Federation of Women in Cuba. Um, about the rights of women specifically and human rights generally. Um, I don't know whether they still operate and, and, and what they are in fact doing for women. Um, if they still operate, it would be interesting to find out um, whether they do. I know they are a government body, that I do know. So if you could, exactly. if you could answer, so well, please exactly. continue to give us information. Thank you. Okay. Um, um, gracias. Thank you. Yes, the uh, Federation of Cuban Women is still operational. And once again, it's the only official body allowed by the government in defense of women. It has been questioned not only by me, but uh, at this hearing, but by the network of uh, women from civil society. It has been questioned because it actually, it only works for the women who agree with the socialist ideas of the state. So it does not represent all Cuban women. It does not represent human rights defenders. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't see anyone else asking for the floor. Our special rapporteur had to exit for a prior commitment, but then I would like to uh, wrap up this hearing and say, first of all, that we condemn most energically the facts that were reported as a systematic violation of human rights the degrading and cruel treatment that was reported here that have taken place even uh, against persons with disabilities. It's completely unacceptable. It's something that has been going on, as you have said, systematically over and over again. And we condemn this most energically. After the end of a period of sessions, we issue a press release where we discuss these hearings and we will definitely uh, discuss 
what you have expressed here today. Also, we would like to say that we will keep on monitoring the human rights situation in the island. We've seen with concern at the commission and also with the uh, rapporteur for freedom of expression that there seems to be an intention to disarticulate uh, all forms of um, expression that go against the regime. This is done in several ways, but we have seen disproportionate convictions in summary trials that are an attempt to intimidate those who wish to um, manifest against the regime so that they will be intimidated by these convictions. We've seen some leaders from those manifestations who were, who were not allowed to go back to their countries after leaving the island for some reason. This is an, a coordinated effort that seeks to um, to uh, annul all uh, forms of uh, protest against the regime. We would like to thank you because you are giving us information about different groups that are whose rights are being violated. But there's something important here because that there is no law and order. There's no democracy. There's no freedom of expression in Cuba. It is necessary to know that when there's not a democratic regime, when there's no separation of powers, there can be no respect for human rights. Quite the opposite. We only see systematic violations in Cuba. And you have our commitment to visibilize this situation. And finally, we have an announcement. The next meeting of the Cuba network will be on May 4th. And we will be discussing uh, vulnerable persons and groups. So I would like to invite you so that on May 4th, you are part of that meeting of the network. I would like to thank you once again and to congratulate you on your extraordinary work as human rights defendants, defenders. You have an ally in our commission and we will be working to uh, support you in everything we can do. Thank you very much. I will close this hearing now. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.